welcome all of you to come to worship with us this morning. And our service is being led by the Reverend John Turner. Not quite the Reverend John Turner. Do your best. Thank you anyway. That's all. And thank you to Jason for the music. And Al. Monday the 26th, brigade meet at 6 o'clock. And on Wednesday, coffee and chat on Zoom, 10.30 to 11.30. On Thursday, it's tea, toast and talk and a place to meet, 10 till 12. Next Sunday, the 2nd of July, at 10.45, worship will be led by the Reverend Jay Phelps. Um, we've got birthdays this week. On the 26th, it's Judith Rabbit. So we wish her a very happy birthday. The Northampton Area Churches Partnership Commissioning Service will be here on the 9th of July at 3 o'clock. Please sign the notice in the corridor if you wish to take part. And that week there will be no morning service. Um, I've got um, Long at the URC. On the 1st of July at 2.30, they have an afternoon of song, strawberries and cream. Tickets are £6, and details are on the post in the corridor. And there's Bethany Homestead Garden Party on the 8th of July. It's 11.30 to 3.30, and there'll be refreshments and lots of stalls. And there's, oh, from, this is from Bethany, a two-bedroom cottage in Carey Row, an upstairs one-bedroom flat in Rodhouse Row, a small single upstairs flat in Lewis Row are all available, and application forms can be obtained from Mrs Jean Wiggins. <coughs> Good morning everybody, it's lovely to be able to share worship with you again. It's quite a long time since I was last here. And my thanks to Fred for uh, telling me that in fact there's another birthday tomorrow. Uh, and that is of Philip Doddridge, who uh, would have been, Fred says, 351 I think it uh, would have been. So. Uh, Sorry? Oh, 20. Sorry. Oh, well. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's good to be here with you, and I uh, bring you uh, blessings and greetings from my home church at Cretan. We are always in the presence of God, but when we draw near to God, we find that God draws near to us in the name of Jesus Christ. So, shall we sing together our opening hymn, which is new every morning.
So let's now come before God in prayer, shall we? God of all love, all truth, all mercy, we come to give praise to you for your love. The love of creator for the creation, the love of saviour for the broken, the love of comforter for the overwhelmed. We come to spend time in your presence and with your word. The word which is sharper than a two-edged sword, keen, testing and trustworthy. We come to confess to you our failings, our foibles, our faults. Forgive us, we pray. In your mercy, make us new. In your truth, give us strength. And in your love, set us on your way once again. God came to earth in Jesus Christ to speak words of love, mercy and truth. He says to us, you are a beloved child of God. He made whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. And shall we now join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. going to sing again uh, now, uh, this time, uh, I'm going to just read this, I saw it starting to get worse than it used to be, where are we? Uh, all my hope on God is founded, so it's all my hope on God is founded. <laughs>
in our gospel reading, we get some wonderful words of comfort, which I think, given the state of things in the world as they are today, is a real source of comfort. Because we're small in number, age is beginning to take its toll on us, we often feel very weak, very insignificant against all of the uh, what really is false might and power of these dictators who seem to be calling the shots in so many parts of the world today. And yet, even the hairs on your head are numbered. I wonder how many hairs are on the heads of each one of us present here today. I know that unfortunately uh, I'm not contributing uh, that many, but even so, they're absolutely innumerable. I don't think that uh, it would even make sense for anyone to try and uh, actually count them. But Jesus says that God, the Father, knows us so well, he knows the answer to all of these questions. He knows each one so well. And despite that, God also loves us, each one of us, perhaps each one of our hairs. And I think in times of difficulty, that's a great verse to take home with us, to treasure, to nurture, to remember, to enable us to keep plodding on as we do our best to fulfill that commission that Jesus gave first of all to his disciples and down the ages that commission has come to us in our age. So we do what we can in love. So let's now sing together Be Thou My Vision.
And so now we're going to have uh, our readings from God's Word. Genesis chapter 21 verses 8 to 21. The birth of Isaac. The Lord blessed Sarah as he had promised, and she became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham when he was old. The boy was born at the time God had said she, he should be born. Abraham named him Isaac. And when Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him. And as God, had command, as God had commanded, Abraham was a hundred years old. And when Isaac was born, Sarah said, God has brought me joy. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong, wrong verses here. I will start again. It is the birth of Isaac, but I should have started at, at verse 8 and I'm starting at the beginning. The child grew, and on the day that he was weaned, Abraham gave him a great feast. One day, Ishmael, whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham, was playing with Sarah's son Isaac. Sarah saw them and said to Abraham, Send this slave girl and her son away. The son of this woman must not get any part of your wealth, which my son Isaac should inherit. The trouble with Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son also. But God said to Abraham, Don't be worried about the boy and your slave at Hagar. Do whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that you will have a descendant, and I have promised I will also give many children to the son of the slave girl, so that they will become a nation. He too is your son. Early the next morning, Abraham gave Hagar some food and a leather bag full of water. He put the child on her back and sent her away. She left and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was all gone, she left the child under a bush and sat down about a hundred metres away. She said to herself, I can't bear to see my child die. While she was sitting there, she began to cry. God heard the boy crying, and from the heaven the angel, God spoke to Hagar. What are you troubled about, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying. Get up, go and pick him up and comfort him. I will make a great nation out of his descendants. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well. She went and filled the leather bag with water and gave some to the boy. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the wilderness at Paran and became a skillful hunter. His mother found an Egyptian wife for him. Thanks be to God. And my apologies. Gospel reading is Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. <coughs> Sorry. No pupil is greater than his teacher. No slave is greater than his master. 
so a pupil should be satisfied to become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If the head of the family is called Beelzebul, the members of the family will be called even worse names. So do not be afraid of people. Whatever is now covered up will be uncovered and every secret will be made known. What I am telling you in the dark, you must repeat in broad daylight. And what you have heard in private, you must announce from the housetops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of God, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. For only a penny you can buy two sparrows, Yet not one sparrow falls to the ground without your father's consent. As for you, even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth much more than many sparrows. For that those who declare publicly that they belong to me I will do the same before my Father in heaven. But if anyone rejects me publicly, I will reject him before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the world. No, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to set sons against their fathers, daughters against their mothers, daughters-in-law against their mothers-in-law. Your worst enemies will be the members of your own family. Those who love their father or mother more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who love their son or daughter more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who do not take up their cross and follow in my footsteps are not fit to be my disciples. Those who try to gain their own life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. Thanks be to God. Thank you for those readings. They're both from the lectionary and they're both extraordinarily challenging, but I think they are really quite pertinent to the situation that we face in our generation today. But before I say a bit more about it, we're going to first of all sing Great is Thy Faithfulness, and that will then be followed by the offering being taken up. So let's sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Father, we offer you these gifts of our money together with our love and our service. Lord, we know that without you, we have nothing. So we are merely giving back to you what is yours. Help us, Lord, to use this money and your gifts to us wisely that your name may be glorified in all the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. These readings present a huge challenge for me to preach on in a way that is sensitive and encouraging. In view of the fragile state of many of our URCs. And quite apart from that, as I watch what is happening in the world, I struggle not to get depressed by the continuous emphasis on the bad news by our media. The depth of depravity and cruelty to which our species is capable of sinking is appalling. And you have need to look no longer than what's going on in Russia and Ukraine and in Sudan and various other parts of the world to see this. And incidentally, our Old Testament reading is one of the ones that uh, Andy Gronston, uh, our URC Minister for Digital Worship, picked out as being parts of the Bible that we prefer not to uh, think about because it deals with uh, some extraordinarily difficult issues. Over thousands of years of civilization, humankind can't really pride itself on being a noble kind of beast, because we haven't really moved beyond the savagery of the rest of the animal kingdom. And I fear that uh, our current 21st century hubris of thinking how wonderful we are is misplaced. We are, in fact, the product of genetic programming that is shared by a surprisingly large degree with the other species with which we can inhabit this planet. We thus have a deeply implanted instinct for self-preservation, which manifests itself in ways that are parallel to animal behaviour elsewhere, and which recent research has shown is particularly noticeable when the lower primates, such as chimpanzees, are studied. That well-known atheist, Richard Dawkins, has put it down to what he calls the selfish gene. 
And although I profoundly disagree with much of what Dawkins peddles, I find I cannot dismiss the scientific knowledge that has been gained through ever improving observational techniques and technology, coupled with more rigorous standards of verification. I wonder how many of you are fans of the uh, BBC TV programme Spring Watch. I haven't watched it actually this year, but uh, I find the in relentlessly enthusiastic style of presentation to be irritating, but the content is often fascinating. Sometimes a cockbird is seen to be tipping newly hatched chicks out of the nest, thus ensuring that they will die. And on the face of it, this is bizarre. But then comes a possible explanation. Perhaps the cockbird had paired up with the henbird after she had been impregnated, but before she had laid the eggs. Somehow that cockbird had instinctively realised that it was not the father of the chicks and was doing what had to be done to ensure that these nestlings were eliminated prior to a second clutch of eggs being laid for which this cockbird was definitely responsible and would pay, play a full role in rearing. Maybe the dark things which occur in some dysfunctional families involving a wicked step-parent are not so surprising after all. But of course it does not make such actions any less abhorrent and they deserve to be utterly condemned. And I'm sure you've guessed already that the sad story of Hagar serves as an illustration. Until the times that she miraculously gave birth to Isaac, Sarah was prepared to tolerate the Egyptian slave girl as a concubine of her husband Abraham. Then the gloves were off. Hagar and Ishmael were rivals to Sarah and Isaac. Sarah instinctively wanted to ensure that there would be no challenge to Isaac's birthright, and so Hagar and Ishmael had to be got rid of. Some 4,000 years have passed since Sarah banished Hagar and Ishmael to the harshness of the desert. And yet the Middle East is still living with the consequences of the rivalry and hatred that was created within Abraham's own family so long ago. A hatred that has been carefully nurtured over countless generations. And where had God been during all this? As Christians, we believe that it was through God's grace that Sarah was able to conceive Isaac in the first place, and that it was through God's grace that Hagar and Ishmael were able to survive their desert exile. Furthermore, the lesson we can take from this passage in the book of Genesis is that through her actions, Sarah not only became an opponent of Hagar, but even of God. When the story is read with Hagar in focus, it is a tale of salvation, defined not so much as a miracle, but as liberation from oppression. From this perspective, it is an ironic story, because the oppressor is Sarah, 
And the one leading the liberating power of God is an Egyptian. That an Egyptian woman is a slave to an Israelite ancestor and then driven into the wilderness with little hope of survival is a story that is more familiar, of course, in the book of Exodus, where the roles are reversed. Of course, hand in hand with oppression and rivalry goes the emotion of fear. Fear triggers, triggers either the wish to run away, to escape the aggression, or the desire to stand one's ground and fight the threat, preferably by getting the knockout blow in first. Whether it is to be fight or flight will depend both on the circumstances of the situation as well as the mental makeup of the person who feels threatened. And our Gospel reading is set at the point where Jesus is commissioning his disciples to go out to their Jewish compatriots, the lost sheep of Israel, and to proclaim good news to them, healing the sick at the same time. It will be a stern test of their resolve and courage and so Jesus is building these qualities up in them by giving them some advice as to the relationship between master and disciples, telling them who to fear, certainly not fellow men and women, and what the real cost of discipleship can be. We are told that our faithfulness as disciples will result in persecution. But it is comforting to note that in both the Old and New Testament readings, God appears to be on the side of the oppressed rather than the oppressor. I believe that one of the reasons why the church is so weak in the Western world is that we have become timid. We do not wish to make ourselves a laughing stock in a society that is embarrassed by verbal professions of faith. However mild they might be, we've become adept at accommodating the gospel to our culture without the threat of fire and sword. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian and pastor who faced the Nazi threat fearlessly in World War II and paid for it with his life, once said, those who are still afraid of men have no fear of God, and those who have fear of God have ceased to be afraid of men. He went on to exhort his fellow preachers of the gospel to recollect this saying daily. I'm not sure what I do, but I ought to. In a world where actions speak louder than words, we must rely on God's Spirit to be the controlling influence upon us so that we can live up to our high calling and make sure that it's God that gets the glory. And it's interesting that the word Christian was originally coined as a derogatory term, meaning little imitators of Christ. The Jesus who was being imitated was generally seen at that particular point in history as a man with blasphemous delusions of grandeur 
who'd been executed as a common criminal. Well, Christians have continued to get a bad press for it in some quarters down the centuries, sadly often deserving it. Now it is our turn to do better, God willing. Amen. So let's now come to our prayers of intercession, which I'm following today the prayers that were written by Ruth Whitehead for uh, the Daily Devotions website. Let's pray. God of all mercy, we bring our prayers to you. You alone can help and save us. We pray for those who feel their life is lost in deep water and great darkness. For victims of natural disaster. For those trapped in debt or addiction. We pray for all who love and serve those in this kind of need. We pray for those who fear the deep will swallow them up, for those facing bullying or oppression, for those undergoing medical tests or treatment. We pray for those who speak out for justice and kindness. We pray for those whose distress leads them to feel that God's face is turned against them. For those struggling with lack of self-worth. For those with poor mental health. We pray for all who support and encourage vulnerable people. And we pray for those who need to know that you, loving God, draw near to them. For those whose lives have just begun or whose lives have been changed dramatically. For those nearing death. We pray for all who accompany others and bring deliverance. Loving God, save us, lift us up, draw us, draw near to us, that our prayers may be heard and answered, and we and all your children know your love more deeply. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our closing hymn is My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
in peace to serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon each one of you and those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.